maximize the abilities of every employee and build stronger relationships with seasoned staff, new talent, and the company itself. And ultimately, my work in building stronger bonds allows for a better return on talent, which then, of course, affects current and future P&L. So that's what I do, and that's how I got here. Millennials. Millennials were born from 1981 to 1996. Now, of course, a, a number of different places will tell you differently, but that, that's what I'm going to go with. <laughs> and what makes them special is from day one, they were born with technology. Okay. I don't know if you guys have ever researched this, but the laptop, the first laptop came out in 1981. Okay. So that not only are they born with technology, but the technology does not have to be anchored to a desk. Okay, it can be in a lap, it can be in your hand. They were born to baby boomers who were very idealistic in their outlook and also came from uh, parents who were very um, workaholic. So therefore, what they tried to do is they tried to balance and make sure that their children got a lot of attention, which then became that, uh, of course, we've all heard it, those parents became helicopter parents, okay? And they also became their kids' best friends, okay? And that has influenced tremendously how millennials act in the workplace and how they function and how they take risks or they don't and how they need a family around them because their family has been very important to them. They need a family around them. They need a community where they work. They are incredibly smart, very tech savvy. They always actually usually end up teaching the more seasoned people at their companies how to use technology, how to get things done in a better way. Okay, they love communication. Okay, they love to get as much communication and feedback as possible, and they will ask questions about it. They are very curious. Okay, they want to know why things are the way they are. They are very cause-driven. Okay, causes and missions are very important to them. A lot of companies think, oh, if I give them a lot of perks, that's going to interest them and that's going to keep them. In actuality, it's more important that a company be mission-focused and cause-driven and be willing to listen to them and hear what they have to say and make sure that they have a say in what happens in the company. That's a little bit about millennials. So if you could just quickly, I mean, the, uh, most demographers look at the society in four generations. So there's the millennials, but could you just talk about the ones who are older than them, mm -hmm. and then also the ones who are coming up. Okay. So, by 2020, millennials will be 49% of the workforce. So they will be the biggest population in the workforce. Currently, there are about three or four generations in the workforce now. There is the baby boomers. Baby boomers were born between 1946 and 1964. And as I've said, they were the ones who raised most of the millennials. They were the idealist generation. They challenged the previous generation and what they felt and how they did things. They valued hard work. They value money. And they need to know that people that they're working with are in front of them. Okay. They tended to work a 70 to 80 hour work week, which uh, the millennials are going to say, no way, uh uh. Then there was Gen X from 1965 to 1980, they were born. Okay. They're a reactive generation. Uh, they experienced the most recent recession. They wanted more work-life balance. And they wanted to be able to enjoy life now. 
They didn't want to be like their predecessors who spent all that time in the office. And millennials we already talked about. And then there is Gen Z, which a lot of you out there are Gen Z. And uh, your category is from 1995 to 2015. You were born. Uh, in two years, you will be 40% of consumers, consumer spending. You spend 78% of your time on your phone. <laughs> and unlike millennials, who spend a lot of time, a lot of concentrated time, you guys are very quick. Everything is very quick. Uh, one thing I wanted to say about millennials before I, I close is because they were so uh, technology focused, and because they were able to get information so quickly, okay, they expect a lot of things very quickly. Okay. Patience is, is not something that they truly comprehend unless they actually are taught. Okay. Because since everything to them has been instantaneous and their world has been always focused on immediate, they don't think about the past, they don't think about the future, they think about the now. That's a great point. Well, I, I personally own and operate two millennials, and so <laughs> I, can, uh, I can verify everything as Susan said. All right, let's go on to Bob. Bob, uh, you're at uh, AMC, Cable Network, and you know, you're know you considered in the business, and not in a bad way, the, quote, legacy media. Can you explain a little bit about that and the way you guys approach advertising? Uh, sure. So first of all, as Alan said, um, I graduated from Queens College many years ago, and it is really great to be back here, and the way this is set up is, is beautiful, so it's really, really good to be here. Um, so legacy media sounds like old, <laughs> you know, and the reality is uh, it's really used to refer to the traditional um, television channels that we all know and love, hopefully love. So it's CBS, ABC, NBC are the traditional broadcast networks. And then you have cable networks like ESPN, CNN, uh, Disney, and, and of course the AMC. This ecosystem creates some of the best storytelling on television today. And it doesn't come cheap. So investing in, so we see some of the best shows that have ever existed on television today and it requires tremendous investment. And um, so the revenue uh, that the current television ecosystem uh, generates comes from two sources. And it's a beautiful thing to have a dual revenue stream. So there's advertising revenue, which is a big piece of, uh, of what the programmers, uh, of the programming revenue. And then there's subscription revenue. <clears throat> and that's what cable operators and satellite television providers generally pay TV operators, pay to the programmers in order to distribute uh, their programming networks. So the total number for the existing programming um, ecosystem, they generate about $140 billion in revenue, and that's split almost equally between subscription revenue from pay TV operators and advertising revenue. And just to provide a little context, um, so-called digital revenue, which is really generated by, most of it today comes from Google and Facebook, and a lot of that is search-related revenue as opposed to video consumption revenue. About five years ago, that was around $50 billion. Today, it's around $100 billion. So you see the digital advertising revenue sort of blowing by TV advertising revenue in the United States. It's just, really, it's just a really interesting phenomenon. And I think the advertisers, <clears throat> what they like about digital is that uh, at least they believe that you can really target uh, your audience so that the advertising dollars that you spend are more efficient and you're not putting your message out in front of customers that are unlikely to, to buy your product. So targeting is a very important characteristic of digital advertising. And then measurability is critical because as I say, they're spending $70 billion on TV advertising and another $100 billion on digital advertising. You want to see, if you're a marketing person, you want to be able to measure the return on that type of investment. So marketers, so, so there's uh, more measurability and more targeting in the digital environment. And 
sort of the key for traditional television companies is to bring those digital characteristics into the video environment. Because there's something about, I mean, people really care deeply about the TV shows that they love. And to have your brand associated with that emotional connection is worth a lot more than, than, than sort of just saying, okay, I have this number of 25 year olds uh, who are looking at my message. To have your brand associated with shows that people love is worth a lot to marketers. And so just to mention, you know, some of the, some of the popular shows in the current uh, television ecosystem, you know, there's This Is Us, there's Game of Thrones, you know, uh, FX has created some great shows like Fargo. I mean, these are shows that really connect with people in, in a deep way. As opposed to the new media companies like Netflix, and Netflix uh, has invested a massive amount of money in just creating content, and they have a, a wide variety of things with the hope that some of their shows will appeal to everybody. And that's, that's, a very, uh, that's a very different model. So Bob, just to you know, kind of put this into context. So in terms of legacy media, you know, back in the day when I was doing this sort of stuff, an advertiser would come in to you and say, I want to reach uh, you know, uh, men uh, 18 to 49. And uh, you know, I really think that uh, Walking Dead is the kind of property that I want. And then you would basically. Good. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> and, and so essentially, you would charge them whatever you could, but even a premium, because they would not only was it the demo, those people, but it was also um, association, as you said, with the show. It seems that, though, there's a lot of empty calories in that, because if you look for 18 to 49 people, you're going to get a whole bunch of people who do watch The Walking Dead and a whole bunch of people who are men, but you're going to get a lot of other people who aren't. And so, you know, that seems to be the big difference. And I know that Asaf will talk about that in a minute in terms of targeting between the legacy way of sort of that big, broad shotgun approach and then the targeted way, which is much more of a rifle shot trying to reach individual people, but they don't have the value of uh, the association with a particular program. Is that a fair? I, I, think, that's, I think that's exactly right. And I think Asaf will say that, that they do sell numbers uh, as opposed to uh, an association with specific TV shows. Uh, and if you could ever combine those two, that would be the most valuable to marketers. Um, and, and the other, so I've really talked about what's important to marketers. The other thing we really have to focus on is what's important to consumers. And by the way, it's never been a better time to be a consumer of, of videos. The best storytelling today, and, and I think everybody's trying to make the experience better. When you see the same commercial and there's low-hanging fruit, when you see the co same commercial over and over in an hour, it's a terrible customer experience. And I think traditional media companies are experimenting with new advertising formats, six-second advertisements. If you can create advertising that really resonates with specific customers, that will make the whole customer experience better and I think make the brand association um, that much more meaningful to consumers and therefore more valuable to, uh, to marketers. Well, that's a great setup for Asaf, who's at Hulu. And as I mentioned in the opening, you guys have a foot in each door. You've got the uh, advertiser-supported model, but you've also got the digital model. If you could explain a little bit about you know, how, how Hulu operates and how digital advertising operates as opposed to legacy. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having us here. This is an awesome room. Um, Alan's bio doesn't do him justice, honestly. Uh, he was my boss's boss's boss for early, early in my career. <laughs> it's an honor, honestly, to be on the panel here with him. Um, he's I sound like Tony dude. Soprano. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, dude's a legend. Just Google him. I got to suck up a little bit as the only non-Queens College on the panel, I guess. Um, I, I, you know, I got to say, just to start, I, I don't like, you know, even as new media, Hulu being new media, I don't like the concept of legacy. TV, I just, I think it's like kind of condescending towards linear television, which is a very, you're welcome, yes, you. uh, which is a very, uh, which is a, a really important medium. I mean, there's never been a reach platform like television that engages people in the way that it does and creates the content that it does. Um, and I think the premise of Hulu was sort of born out of the love of television and being able to sort of just evolve it into the next step. That doesn't mean that the legacy TV companies can't evolve into the same way, 
Um, there's, you know, everybody can use the internet and sort of adopt their business that way. I think that's where everything is going. What makes Hulu a little bit different than the legacy TV is that it's, you know, we're not tied to a linear television schedule. That's really the biggest difference, is that you don't have to be there at 7 o'clock or 9 o'clock to watch Modern Family on a Wednesday to be able to watch your content. Um, and therefore, you don't have to, um, you know, just be talking to a particular show because a particular show um, was always sort of a proxy for an audience that you would reach at that given point in time. But with all of this kind of digital data and being able to serve the right person at the right time, the ad that they want to see, um, and so they can start to watch whatever show they want to watch whenever they want to watch, and we'll just serve them the most relevant ad. It's not like it's going to be, even if you're watching an episode of uh, Seinfeld, represent Queens College, uh, even if you're watching an episode of Seinfeld from, there you go, from like 30 years ago, you're still going to see a relevant ad today. Um, so that sort of changes the model of how television is transacted on. Rather than looking at, you know, Nielsen ratings and what's the best show and where am I going to find, like, the most amount of people, it's let's just find people, the right person, a, a male 18-year-old, wherever they're watching, even if they're watching, you know, back seasons of shows, if they're watching... Bravo lifetime shows that might not skew necessarily male. If they're there watching it, you can reach them. I think the point of measurability is an important one because what Alan used to say uh, for years and years and years doing the, his Olympics roadshow is if you can't measure it, you can't sell it. Um, I've stolen that, by the way, um, and <laughs> called it my own. Um, so, um, you know, being able to measure it is really important. And in, you know, traditional linear um, TV, that can be a little bit more difficult to do but with digital and digital tracking and understanding people's kind of viewer, viewer behavior across screens, it allows you to more fluid, fluidly be able to measure where everybody is kind of all the time um, and get a, a much better view. So I think that the digital world is actually bringing a lot more sort of clarity in the measurement space, uh, which is allowing marketers to be a little bit more uh, precise in their um, marketing approaches. So Asaf, um, so an advertiser comes to you and says, we want, you know, men 18 to 24, yeah. whatever it might be, and you say, okay, I'm going to deliver a certain number of these guys. Yes. Um, how do you know who they are? In other words, where, first of all, where do you get the data that tells you who they are? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, I mean, it depends on the publisher. On the Hulu side, when you sign up, uh, you, tell, you tell us, you know, um, a man, 35 years old, um, this is, um, and, you know, you're signing up. So we have that kind of information. Um, through digital tracking, we can sort of understand people's behavior without being too invasive. We can understand their kind of general viewing behaviors. We can look at your show-specific behaviors and start to estimate where you're going to go or what you're going to do next, and we try to do that. Um, what we've seen in a lot of our work, to, to Susan's point, especially around Gen Z, um, they kind of, they grew up in a world where everything has been... Um, you know, uh, kind of predicted for them. Spotify tells them what shows they want to watch, uh, what music they should listen to. YouTube tells them recommended stuff. Um, Hulu's starting to get into that space. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of sort of data that's starting to get developed on an individual user level so that we can be uh, better at kind of finding you, targeting you, and understanding who you are without being too creepy. That's really the balance, honestly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, to your point, you know, it's, it's no longer, hey, you're going to buy Modern Family and, and it should, uh, we estimate that it's going to get this kind of reach. We say, we're going to serve a million ads and we're going to make sure that we're finding uh, men 18 to 49 within that. Um, and that way it's a little bit more of that. Kind of target the so in, in a particular program, there's a pod, which is where the commercials reside. Yep. In the in the I, the L media, I don't mean to be you know like yeah. you know you basically sell one. Why don't we just call it the current media? the current media? There right. you go. Yeah. You know you usually sell one ad, or maybe you might do a regional thing where in the winter you know Ford's going to sell uh, you know trucks uh, in the north and you know uh, yeah. uh, convertibles in the south. My understanding is that in your case you can sell multiple ads within that pod. So if somebody's going to go in and say, there's the Looming Tower, which is one of your big shows, yeah. there's a pod, how many, you can have many, many commercials in there, right, that are very different, correct? Yeah, so you and I could be watching the same show at exactly the same time. You live in the north, I live in the south, and we're going to see two completely different ads. Um, and that's just based on the information that we have about you. So it's really serving to each individual person what's most relevant to them at that time. That's called dynamic ad insertion. Um, so it's no longer, you know, um, 
in, in scheduled television where the breaks are always the same and we're always, all of us are seeing the same Super Bowl ad at 9.08 p.m. Um, at 9.08 p.m. we're literally seeing completely different ads, even if we're watching the same programming. So that's a little bit of a shift and again, it's more towards that kind of tailored approach of I know a little bit more about you and I'm not going to serve you a convertible ad if you live in Vermont. I mean, you have to understand that this is a disruption with a capital D in terms of the, of, the, of the sales mechanism and process of television. I mean, it occurred over the past five or six years, and a lot of it's driven by the technology, but you know, it's an extraordinarily different model. And one of the questions, of course, and we'll hope to get to it is, you know, is the traditional uh, model sustainable? But Asaf mentioned that you know we have data on these folks, and we don't want to be too creepy. And that leads me to Mara. Not that she's creepy, but, but Mara, Mara wrote an, an amazing book. I mean, she has a whole bunch of, uh, of, of appearances dealing with the effect of advertising on society. But the Black Ops advertising is a very provocative title. Uh, it does not refer to the current administration, I don't believe, but it is an important thing to think about. So I wonder if you could explain a little bit about the title and, um, and what it all means for all this. Sure. Um, actually, being a professor, I have to start with a question. Um, <laughs> how many people like to watch advertising? Okay, well, you would be the exception, though. Overall, people do not like to watch ads. Uh, the other question I'm going to ask you is this. How many people have Netflix? How many people think there's advertising on Netflix? Uh, yeah, a couple, right? There's a whole lot of advertising on Netflix. You think that there's not, but there is. And that gets into this idea of black ops advertising. What you see on Netflix primarily is a kind of, of marketing known as uh, product placement. So if you look at um, House of Cards, House of Cards has actually been dubbed the house of product placement because there's, <laughs> there's actually so much advertising on it. Um, if you watch something like Orange is the New Black, you will see um, cups of Dunkin' Donuts coffee, which I always find fascinating within the confines of a correctional <laughs> institution that they somehow got cups of, of Dunkin' Donuts in there. But they did, right? Um, so that sort of advertising placement gets subtly embedded into the actual content. And that's sort of an older form of what I call black ops advertising. Black ops advertising is advertising that we are not aware of as uh, of consumers of entertainment or news content. And there's primarily two types of uh, black ops advertising. One is called native advertising and the other is branded content. Native advertising is advertising that is created to be indigenous to the place within which it exists. So many of you are probably aware of this in terms of Facebook or Twitter when you see ads that look like content that any of your friends might have posted. Very subtly in that advertising, it will have something that says sponsored or it will say promoted or something like that. Part of the reason why it's very hard for people to recognize this advertising is where it says sponsored is usually under the, the timestamp uh, of when it was posted and until Facebook <coughs> frankly screwed with their algorithms, we never used to look there, but now since they, everything's posted in some weird kind of way, we do tend to look there. But it is very easy, particularly when we're looking at most of this content on our phones. Right? We're not looking at it on tablets or we're not looking at it on computers. It's very difficult for us to be able to see what is um, content, what is sponsored content, and what is something that is posted by a friend. Um, and now that I'm pushing a certain higher number and my eyes aren't as good as they used to be, I find that, that I get drawn in by this more than I used to. Uh, the other kind of content is called branded content. And branded content is different than native advertising in that it is created by the advertiser to be content that, that is something that a consumer wants but doesn't have a sales message connected to it. That's a key point of branded content. So rather it's a, an advertiser uh, providing information to consumers uh, not telling you to buy anything in particular and it look, this too looks like the content um, that exists. So one example used to be um, uh, Casper and some of you might remember this and they actually stu do still advertise on New York City subways, the, the uh, mattress company and they have sort of pastel color ads and stuff like that. They had a website called Van Winkles 
And Van Winkle's was all kinds of information about sleep, and it was about how girls went to the Obama White House and had a sleepover with Michelle Obama. It was information about how pot helps you sleep better and all of this. Uh, but there was no information that, that this was actually produced by Casper until you looked at the bottom. So the idea behind branded content is that advertisers will provide information to consumers uh, because they know the business better than anybody else does. And that's true. Like I, I worked on uh, the Miller beer business. Part of my job was to know the beer business better than anybody else. So we could provide, the, the thinking on that is that, that the advertisers themselves know the industry better than anybody else. The problem with a lot of this advertising, why don't go back to something that Bob said, that I, but I'll talk, add something else to it as well. Um, a lot of money is coming out of so-called legacy media and moving into digital. Most of that money is going to Facebook and Google. Facebook and Google don't create any content. So the money that is was being used to promote, to pay for the kinds of programming that you want to watch is disappearing. And it's really interesting because I deal with this in terms of our students as well. They want to work in television. They want to work in production. And then I say to them, well, do you watch the ads? Do you pay for the content that you engage with? And they say no. And then someone will come on to, uh, oftentimes there's shoots on, on our campus and trucks roll up and wires have to be put down and so on. And I said, that's what it takes to get a television show done. And that all has to be paid for. And the way, that it, the way it has traditionally been paid for is television, uh, is the advertising. And the agreement was that we would get free content by watching the ads. And that agreement has been fundamentally broken. And so when Alan is talking about the fact that there has been this incredible disruption, um, that's what we're talking about. Where is this money going to come from, from to pay for these very expensive television shows to be put onto the screens that we, um, we want to engage with. The other problem in terms of this kind of content is, one, most people don't recognize it. Only 17% of people recognize when they are engaging with this black ops sort of hidden advertising. And this has been research that has been uh, replicated over and over again. University of Georgia, Boston University, and so on, uh, Stanford University have all come up with the same numbers. And we're talking about older people as well as Gen Z. Uh, it doesn't matter who, who what age group you're talking about, people do not recognize when they're engaging with this hidden kind of advertising. The other thing is some of the advertisers that are producing this content are doing so with pretty malicious uh, intents in mind. And the one example I like to give, particularly with this kind of audience, is Discover Card. Discover Card did a, 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 an ad with the New York Times, and the headline was, college is still, uh, still an important investment and something you should, should do, right? Suggesting that everybody should go to college. What they don't say is that they understand that most of your college degree may not be paid for by, by the government or by your own ability to be able to pay for it, but Discover Card will be happy to jump in with much higher interest rates to help you pay the differential, right? And so these companies have a vested interest in selling you ideas in terms of what is most important. Um, Shell Oil also did um, a, 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 an ad, um, though it appeared as an article in the New York Times um, around sustainability. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I don't think Shell Oil is the company I want telling me about how to be sustainable. <clears throat> Just to put a, a pin in uh, what you said about the cost, <clears throat> the average primetime uh, series, uh, drama series, costs between three and four million dollars an episode. I mean, that's how much it costs. So in other words, I think just to give you a sense of what it was, and, you know, cable, some of them are cheaper, some of them are not. Game of Thrones apparently costs 16 million an episode. But again, that's on HBO and there's no advertising on that. But it's just an interesting point. And that leads me to Douglas. Um, Douglas is a, uh, well, he's, he's a critic and a philosopher, but he has some very interesting points of view about advertising and marketing. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about how you think about everything you've just heard. I mean, the thing that occurred to me as everyone was speaking is that, that media and television in particular used to be a way to help people find out about others in the world. And now it sounds like television is a, is a way for corporations to find out about us. 
And that's a profound reversal that I think um, ultimately, if we're really going to spend our time in media, threatens what used to be considered the fabric of society. You know, there's, there's a lot of, of, of well-meaning but kind of divisive language and underlying assumptions in, in this sort of discussion. And I know, and I've been, you know, guilty of it to some extent. I wrote a book called Screenagers in the 90s about what I call digital natives, the kids who were raised with interactive screens and how they were going to be different from us and all. But I was really self-consciously using screenagers as a play on teenagers because teenagers was a term invented by marketers. It was a way of identifying, isolating, and separating out a consumer market from everybody else because teenagers were identified as the people who had the leakiest wallets. They had the, the disposable income because mom and dad were going to work. So we had these teenagers, we'll call them. And that was like the first gen. Right? And when I hear, and, and I know that, that a lot of the research is well-founded, but when I hear us talking about, well, there's Gen X, there's Gen Z, there's Millennials, there's Gen this, and they do this, and they're like this, and they're like this, I try to think, what would it be like if we said, instead of Gen this, Gen that, Gen that, what if we were saying Blacks, Hispanics, Italians, and Whites? Well, the Blacks think this, they like this, they go to work, they want that, these want, it's like, well, we can't do it for that, but we can do it to generations. And when we do it to generations, what are we really doing? I, I think what we're doing is, is for the, the, I suppose, the, the health of a short-term market, what we're doing is, is polarizing people from each other. We're creating these divided, uh, 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 artificially divided consumer profile segmentations, because that's really friendly to algorithms. It's really friendly to marketers. It's really friendly to those who would divide us, but it's really unfriendly to those of us who want to try to find um, the others. You know, it's like television went, it, 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 it's engendering a society. I would say it's not that kids are being raised feeling this way, but it's engendering a society where what matters to me is what matters, right? <laughs> what matters to me? Oh, we give you the advertisement that you want. Oh, good. As long as media is giving me what I want. Oh, it's, it's to me. You know, and that's, I don't know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. And I feel like, not that advertising is dead or anything, but I feel like the best techniques, the psychological techniques, the marketing techniques, the, the, the manipulation and persuasion techniques of advertising have gone from the content side of advertising to the platform side of advertising. The best behavioral designers, the people taking B.J. Fogg's captology classes at Stanford are not going into content advertising, they're going into platform creation. So that they're taking the most cutting edge tools of, of psychological manipulation and putting them into, you know, what color is the tag gonna be on the streak feature of our new messaging app? You know, streaks is the is one of the uh, sort of behavioral finance techniques they use to addict people to making sure you do a message with your friend every single day and things like that. <laughs> or what color we're going to make something, or we're going to put the buy button on the top left of the screen or the bottom right of the screen. And so when I think about advertising as being disrupted, I feel like in, in some ways it hasn't been disrupted, but it's, we are, once you're in the shopping mall, why advertise to anybody? Right? You're already in the mall. So when we're online, we're in the shopping mall. And if you look at what's going to come over the next 10 years with augmented reality, we're going to be living in the shopping mall, you know, helping industry reach us. It, it, it goes all the way back to Versailles, which was really the first reality marketing, that's the first product placement, was, was Versailles, where they, it was a way to, to uh, sell and advertise or, or market French luxury brands to the rest of Europe. They would come, they'd see the mirrors, and drink the wine. And I feel like we're in that now. We're in the advertisement. There's been this weird reversal where, you know, at the same time that kids started to think of American Idol as a way of expressing democracy, you know, and reality TV kind of became government, that there's been this weird reversal where we've walked into the ad and the, the things, the messages are actually coming from out in the real world to maybe, hey, wake up, look out of the, look out of the screen. And the, the reason why I think this is so big is not that these technologies or platforms are really selling products. 
I don't think they are. I don't think they're selling any more products anyway than advertising did. The real problem here is that we've got a multi-trillion dollar technology industry whose entire business model is based on advertising and marketing, where advertising and marketing have never, ever, ever, ever historically taken up more than 3% of GDP. So how do you have the entire NASDAQ stock exchange depending on, on an industry that really only represents 3% of, of GDP? It, it, it doesn't actually work, right? Because these companies are not going to do that by generating profit. They're going to do that by selling their stock, right? That's, that's all they can really do is come up with a model that looks promising and then sell the stock before people realize that it isn't. Um, so the real, when, when, when you really want to think about <coughs> disruption, Who's being disrupted? What's being disrupted? The, the more fun question is to ask, what's not being disrupted? Who is not being disrupted? And those are the people and players that are actually in charge of what's going on here. And I would argue that finally is just the stock exchange, looking for ways to inflate stock values, really with, with very little, with as little regard for the advertising industry as say Uber has for the taxi industry, right? Their real business is their stock, not their their uh, uh, locomotion services. Well, that's really interesting. First of all, Versailles didn't know that uh, Chanel bags came out of there, but okay. <laughs> um, but uh, we, we, you know, we're all going to go home tonight and watch television. We're going to watch a show. And I, I, Mara and, and Douglas make a very interesting point, which is that, you know, so much is, and, and, and Bob too, so much of this advertising is now going to uh, these platforms like Google and uh, Facebook that, that do not deal with content whatsoever. But assuming, you know, we still want to be watching entertainment programming of some sort, I guess my question is, um, if, is, the, is the current model, which is, there is a commercial and, you know, the, the marketer gets to reach people so they can sell a whole bunch of crates of coke. Does that have long-term viability? Are we going to have to move much more to the world of, of Mara and, uh, and Douglas? And I would ask the two guys whose uh, jobs and kids' college education uh, funds <laughs> depend upon working through this. What do you guys think? I mean, uh, how long can this, uh, uh, you know, model be sustained? Well... <clears throat> I think advertising is always going to be critical, and as we discussed before, there's about $170 billion spent between digital and television advertising today. I don't know what the total advertising spend is. I'm going to guess around $300 billion. I think our GDP is 18 or $19 trillion, something like that. So I'm not sure that that's going to move a, a tremendous amount. But I think advertising is always going to be um, a critical activity by anybody who's trying to sell products. And it's very interesting that you talk about the platform advertising. AT&T, the telephone company, acquired DirecTV, and they acquired Time Warner. So they own HBO, they own TNT, they own TBS, and they own DirecTV. They have about one trillion impressions every single year, and they hired this guy, Brian Lesser, who's one of a handful of people that reports to the AT&T CEO, and he's from Group M Advertising, and he is an advanced advertising expert. And he's declared, you know, we really have to create an advertising platform that's going to scale. And they think that by doing that, they can generate two or three times the, the rate of uh, advertising revenue that DirecTV and Time Warner Cable traditionally did. So yes, that, that is happening. And, um, you know, advertising will be around, I think, forever. Asaf, you got any thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I think advertising will remain. The version that it is today will not, whether it moves towards black ops, if we're going to call it that, um, <laughs> remains to be seen. I mean, I do think, you know, some of the work that we've done at Hulu does show that people, especially younger generations, um, so, you know, when they recognize the, you know, in uh, native advertising or in the integrations, that's a better experience for them than the standard pod and having all of their shows kind of broken up. I think the philosophy that we take at Hulu is, um, you know, when, when I started uh, almost four years ago there, um, Hulu was a completely ad-supported model, um, and then they released this no-ad model. Uh, you could pay $4 more um, and not see any ads. 
Um, and, you know, uh, they told me that once I accepted the job, I thought I was going to be out of a job. Um, so we started to do some work to try to understand really what the, a lot of those drivers were. And what we found was that there, you know, there was about 10 to 15 percent of the population that was totally averse, was never going to sign up for Hulu, like never wanted to see an ad, was going to pirate the content. They would do anything to avoid that advertisement. And so giving them the option to pay $4 more for that same content allowed them the choice and control that uh, they could then decide whether they wanted that. Getting that amount of money, funneling that into content creation makes the economics of that piece work a little bit better. Um, and then for the other remaining uh, groups, we basically broke them out into high, medium, and low receptivity, about a third each. High receptivity people were those who like watch people who watch the Super Bowl for the ads. There's plenty of those people. Um, they're not, you know, I think in a world, and most of us, uh, you know, would avoid the ad if we can. But people understand sort of the trade-off there. So I think again, it's giving choice and control to the consumer so that they can decide on their on their side whether they want to be a part of that environment. Um, and then figuring out the economics around it. I mean, I think, you know, the work that is being done on GDPR in the EU is giving control towards the uh, user to say, you, you help me opt into this thing. No longer should it be you sort of jamming it down my throat. I need to be the better, I, I need to be able to control that. There needs to be more done on that side without getting too political. Uh, but I think we are making strides into a world where um, people are going to have a lot more say in how much they consume from an advertising standpoint and what those trade-offs are going to be versus getting the content that they want. <coughs> yeah, and if, I, if you, I'm sorry. sorry, go ahead. If you can pay for it. Right. I mean, right. that's, yes. that's, that's the big issue, yes. and, that, and that's one of my concerns is that, you know, we're going to have a bifurcated society between those who can afford to pay their way out of seeing advertising and those who can't. And the other problem that aligns with this, and this is, a, this is an issue for, for marketers as well, is the people who can't afford to pay their way out of seeing ads tend to be the people that advertisers don't want to reach. And so you have a real serious issue in terms of how do you, how do you make this model work so in I, a different way. So I do way. want to say on that side, um, and I don't, I don't agree with that, I don't disagree with that. <coughs> um, but again, from that work that we did about the high, medium, low receptivity, no receptivity people, when we looked at that, my, my concern was the same, was that $4 delta just going to keep poor Queens College students in, and they were going to be the only ones that are watching them. And all of a sudden, you know, all of the other people that marketers are trying to reach were moving over. What we found was that that wasn't really the case. Um, income, gender, age didn't really have an influence on whether you were receptive, it, what, what your receptivity level. It was really your just aversion to ads. It was sort of how you kind of curate your, your own experience. It was like, I don't want to be bothered with this. I'm a really busy person. I'm, I have a lot going on. Uh, I don't want to be bothered with a lot of those ads. I think we've seen that shift a little bit over time. But again, I think this is inter interesting on the Hulu platform because you have the choice between ads and not. Today, 70% um, of people who sign up will still pick the ads, even with that $4. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and that's the point that I wanted to echo. It's just such a fascinating, this is a real life experiment that Hulu's doing. And I don't know that there's many other examples where you have a choice. You can pay $4 extra and not watch any commercials, and the majority are opting to, to watch the commercials. It's just a very interesting real-life data point. So one of the issues about the subscription model where you pay, I think, is a problem with media executives. And I can give you just a very quick personal story. And this goes way back. In like 2000, when I came to NBC, they used to have something called the President's Council, the presidents of all the companies. And I'm this young guy coming in. And I was there to talk about internet. Now, at the time, and none of you will remember this, you used to have to dial up, it was very slow. Internet was really fast. I mean, it was a whole new thing. I mean, it sounds crazy right now. But it cost about 50 bucks. And I said to this group, you know, the work that we've done suggests that this is not going to take off so fast. This was 2000. And all these people, all these guys, and it was guys, turned around and said, like, who is this guy? And why do we bring him here? He's out of his mind. And I said, listen, the median income uh, in America is $50,000. The median income in this room is a million dollars. So the fact of the matter is you guys assume that people can afford to pay for everything when in fact they really can't. 
And, and, you know, I think Myra's point about, and we did this research all the time about commercial avoidance. I mean, how many of you raise your hands that I really don't like commercials? So with all due respect to what Asaf is saying, and I know that you have to figure out a way to work within it, it seems to me that commercial avoidance is a real issue. But the, at the end of the day, just having people move over to a subscription model, whether it's an HBO or whether, you know, NBC or AMC moves into a subscription mode, uh, is not going to be as easy as people think because the amount of money people have to spend on this stuff is very, very limited. Um, so I don't know, any, any thought? Douglas, do you have any thought about this? Well, I mean, I'm thinking all the way back to the penny newspapers in the early 1900s, you know, that they uh, basically they found out that they, instead of charging, you know, a, a buck or 50 cents for a little newspaper, you could charge a penny if you had ads in them. And it seemed like a good deal. You know, and the, the, I guess the, the trick with that is that once you put ads into your content, it changes the nature of the content. So once we had national brands, we had newspapers then trying to figure out how do I not betray a particular bias anymore? How do I kind of take the opinion out of this paper so that everybody so that the brand isn't associating itself with something that someone is going to find objectionable. It's actually when balanced journalism was born in America. Before that, you could just have an opinion because you were sort of local. And I feel like now we're fine. We're kind of become coming full circle on that now. You know, and even with the that people, are, you know, okay, I know I can buy the Guardian and I'll get the good lefty perspective. I can buy the Post and get the right wing perspective. I can watch Fox and get this or MSNBC and get that. Um, I, I don't know, I just feel like the, that advertising is, it, it influences the content so much more than we generally recognize, whether it's trying to look neutral or trying to look more opinionated. And there is this sense when you talk about, you know, legacy TV, I feel like the, the kind of the, the powerful legacy style television ends up on HBO or on, on some of the, 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 the Hulu channels um, because they're no longer worried about serving as the, you know, serving as the, the, the entertainment within an advertising feed. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of liberating. So I feel like content is, is, has been liberated by people who are willing to pay or even who are willing to work around, you know, pay structures in order to find stuff. They still, somehow they watch Game of Thrones anyway, right? They, they, they get it. Steal it, but that's a whole other Yeah, even if it's a day later, but... But, but uh, let's, let's just stipulate for the moment yeah. that, that, that we do need advertising, at least in the short term, because marketers have got to go out and sell their products, and they have to reach people. So I would ask Susan, I mean, given the sense about these millennials and all that, um, you've talked a little bit about, you know, that they're very screen wedded and all that kind of stuff, but how do we break through with advertising? I mean, is the only way to break through with uh, Mara's Black Ops, or is there a way to do it in a way that's more in keeping with the way Bob's business operates? Well, one thing that I want to say from the get-go that I read is that your average person receives 30,000 media impressions a day. That's a lot to break through. Okay. So how do you do that? Okay. Yeah. How do you do that? Do you make it very targeted? And for the millennial and the Gen Z audience, it has to be very authentic. Okay, when it comes to advertising, it can't be sales oriented because Gen Z's, millennials, will turn away. Okay, they don't trust something that says, buy me, buy me now, you need me now. I saw this, I, I took a class and there was multi-generations in it. And at the end of the class, of course, the people teaching the class wanted people to come back and take more classes. Of course, that's how they make money. And we all knew that. Do we want to hear it? No. And with the younger members of the class, they didn't even want to be there during the sales pitch. Even though it was a subtle sales pitch, they just revolted and said, I don't want to be here. I don't want to listen to this. I just want to leave now. I know you guys got to do this, but 
I, I'm shut down, there's no way I'm taking more classes, not after this. So it's something that we have to think about for advertising. It's got to be very subtle, and it's got to be something that's not pushy, and something that in some way makes their life better or more enhanced and makes them better. Yeah, and there's some good examples of that where, I don't know if you get the New York Times, a couple of years ago, um, Beth Coleman, who runs, uh, who used to run uh, marketing for GE, so clever. They put, I don't know if you remember, they put a Google Cardboard in the New York Times, and it was Google Cardboard in the New York Times. So Google Cardboard is a, a cheap VR that you put your phone in. Um, it was launching the New York Times virtual reality services with a Google thing sponsored by GE. Now, what's What's so great about that is it's not an ad, although it is marketing. It was a sponsored event, a sponsored thing. So now GE has associated itself with saying, we just want people to be smarter. We want them to know about virtual reality. So it's like, okay, now GE's positioned as, well, they must have something to do with VR and Google and information and that. The New York Times gets a free viewer for its new services. And Google gets to place itself as, so it was like, wow. And that's the equivalent of when I watch, I mean, sometimes I'll watch even like American Horror Story or something. That's on your network, right? Okay. FX, and it's an excellent show. It, oh, okay. <laughs> but but, but what they do is they'll say, this, this evening of American Horror Story is sponsored by like Samsung or Sony or whatever with limited advertisements. And just to know that these people paid so I could have limited advertisements puts me in a really good mood. I'll even watch their friggin' 30 seconds about their new 5G catastrophic Wi-Fi. Um, you know, because they've subsidized my viewing and it feels like a very different thing. It's more like Jack Benny saying, oh, my show is brought to you by Maxwell House, which I drink and I love it, yay. But they're not, they're not interrupting with ads, it's sort of disclosed. Yeah. I mean, GE is a really good example in terms of this. They do a lot of really, interesting branded content and one of the things that they did was at the time of the anniversary of the 1969 moon landing they created these shoes and then sold them for nineteen dollars and sixty nine cents right for 1969 uh, but they were they did that because they had created the technology that went into the original boots that went to the moon they only sold a hundred of them, and they sold out right away, and then they started being resold on eBay, but they got all kinds of press around this. What's really interesting about it is that GE no longer has any consumer-facing products, right? They don't sell refrigerators and, and all that kind of stuff. So they were doing it for what Douglas was talking about, which is for their stock prices. Hmm. They're trying to let people want for their stock price and two, to help young people understand that this is a hip company that's doing interesting things in terms of technology that they might want to work for. So Asaf, um, a lot of what uh, digital requires is to really understand who each of these people are. And that's the issue of scraping, you know, the internet, where you go, and all that to get that data. Are you worried at some point about uh, regulation? About this thing may go too far, and if you lose all that data, you sort of have lost that capability. No. Um, yeah, no, it's a good point, point. Um, and it is something that worries me. Um, honestly, I, I, I think it's good. If we're, if we're asking for my political opinion. I think, it's a, I think it's a good thing. Everybody should sort of have control over theirs. And it's our job as marketers, advertisers, to figure out how to grow a business around the needs of the consumer. And if the consumer is telling us, like, you're being weird and you're taking, all my, you're taking my data and you're doing it for various reasons, then we should do that. I mean, I think Facebook and Google this year kind of proved that to us. Um, and, and that is, in my opinion, where everything needs to move. Um, that, again, puts me on the line for my job, and i got to figure out another way to do it. Uh, but, I mean, I do think that there is a trade-off. We've seen this, especially with younger generations. We've seen that they understand that there is some, some things that are beneficial to you. Um, you know, having uh, your location services on so that you can get your weather provides you some sort of value. Um, being able to get YouTube recommendations based on other content that you watch can help you. It's not always right, uh, and that's something that I think we need to work on, and I think, you know, we also need to be careful to not live in our own bubble of just sort of self-approval of the things that we like, and then we're never exposed to other things. 
Um, so it, it, is, it is a really careful balance, but ultimately I think it has to start with the consumer, how they want to be talked to, how they want to be you know, approached, and then we can figure out as, a, as an industry how to move around it. But, but given, given the issue of commercial avoidance, and it is a big deal, I mean, in other words, this whole group here said that they don't really like to watch commercials. I understand sometimes there's a trade-off and all yeah. that, but I guess the question really is, um, and do we need, as an industry, if you really want to break through and get to all these folks, to move away from the 30-second spot, which used to be the gold standard in terms of selling, to, to Mara's, uh, you know, black ops. And is that really where the business is going to go, to some sort of, you know, um, underground, very subtle kind of, uh, or, or what Douglas mentioned, uh, you know, kind, because people, the minute they see, again, I'm not, you know, the, the thought is, the minute they see a spot, yeah. they turn away and they want to come back. So, I mean, is that the solution to this whole thing, to, to go a very different way with advertising? I mean, we've done some work uh, that shows that one in five people think that media is going to stay the same, same pod, same breaks. 60% um, of people say um, that they're expecting more targeted ads, which does imply that sort of trade-off of data. Um, and Gen Z and millennials, specifically, more so than their older counterparts, um, expect native advertising. So I think the, whether that's the right thing to do um, or what's going to happen, um, you know, I think the expectation is that that's sort of where the future is headed. Um, yeah, that's... But I think we need to do a better job, and this, and this is why I wrote Black Ops Advertising, is to do a better job of educating people about how their data is being used, that it's being collected. And what I found in interviewing people who work in the industry, no disrespect, is that they believe that consumers understand all of this. And my... The findings is, is that they don't. Um, Joe Toro and some of his colleagues at University of Pennsylvania did a study called Trade-Off Fallacy. Um, and you can Google it and get a PDF of it online. And, and specifically says that people don't understand that their data is being collected. And people, you know, I think of the same story that Alan was talking about, you know, everybody in the room was making a million dollars. You know, people in the room are people who work in the industry and deal with data all the time. Really start to lose a sense of how much more they know about how data is being used, that data is being collected, and how it is then being used to target specific advertising to people. Um, I think the vast majority of people, I know the vast majority of people don't have that kind of understanding. Uh, let me open it up to uh, you guys. Uh, what do you think about all this? I mean, Eddie, yes. My name is Jennifer. I'm a student here. Um, and is there a mic? You hold on one sec, okay, Jennifer? <laughs> Hi, my name is Jennifer. I'm an accounting major. I'm graduating this semester. I'm a millennial, and <laughs> I'm proud of it. <laughs> um, but I, I guess my statement slash question is, I think it's something more of like a combination of what Mara and you said about um, product placement and kind of like selling without selling. Um, I did business to business marketing when I was 21 and it was the most humiliating thing I ever had to do <laughs> <laughs> because, um, but I learned so much through it. Um, one of the things my boss said was people love to buy but hate to be sold. Mm -hmm. And I think that millennials are a testament to that. And for me, I find that um, I disagreed with what he said about the sponsorship. Even that bothers me, which is funny because I'd never noticed it without this conversation. I don't mind seeing a Dunkin' Donuts cup in Orange is the New Black mm. or watching Blacklist and someone mentioned Facebook or Instagram in the background. Like Passive advertisement to me is much more like palpable mm. than anything that's very direct and striking. It's mm. more of a turn off. And even like with YouTube, like uh, YouTube marketers, it's like when you get to know someone's personality and you get to like watch them and experience them, it's, even when they're selling to you, it's more discreet because if they're saying that they're trying something out, 
then maybe I'm more open to trying it out because I like them and I trust them. Can I ask a question? That, um, and we haven't talked at all about influencers. Um, what if you found out that somebody who you followed on Instagram was actually being paid $75,000 to put something in front of you, but there was nothing in that information that told you that they were selling you something? I don't watch those people knowingly. I usually watch the ones who acknowledge that they're being sponsored, acknowledge that this is an advertisement, and maybe I'll maybe I'll support the the video. Maybe I'll watch it just to see what it is, but I'll watch the unsponsored content. As long as they're disclosing it, then maybe I'll watch it, but I'd probably be more likely to watch something that's not sponsored. So like a shopping haul? I don't know if that is. Yeah. A shopping haul is like if a girl goes to like a couple of stores that I like, right? Mm -hmm. Then maybe I'll watch the show or the video in order to see what they have that's new so I don't have to go to the store and see it. And then based off of how it fits on her, if she has a similar body type to me, then maybe I'll go visit the store. But if I don't like what she tried on or if she doesn't like what she tried on, then right. that's what makes me trust But them. you're okay if they're sort of representing it that they went to a store. And you found out, well, they didn't really go to the store. They actually got sent stuff along with $10,000 from each of these companies. Would you feel bad about that? Or would you be, it's cool, I, she can pretend she got it in the store. As long as her content is not exclusively for like advertising purposes. So like say she does tutorials or something. Like she's teaching me something, making me better, I guess. That goes back to what mm -hmm. she's saying. Um, as long as I'm getting something that maybe she's not making direct money from a specific place, then I would still give her that trust. Yeah, I've got a quick question for you. Do you trust her? <laughs> Sorry. Do you, do you trust those people more because they're peers? Does that have anything to do with it? Yeah, it's like, it goes back to what I said originally. I think it's more so like, it's someone who could be my friend. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I like her personality. Yeah. Yeah. Other, other questions? Yes. Just wait for the mic, okay? Just so that. Uh... In the middle. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. All right. Well, talk loud. I'll do that. Uh, my name is John. I am at Amazon in Sales in New York. But I'm curious that the word Amazon never came up. And I want to hear the panel's thoughts. I want to hear the panel's thoughts about the selection process for HQ2 and what uh, Amazon put municipalities through and how they acquired so much data about cities and how they turned everything on its head. Nashville was never getting HQ2 in the first place. Let's all be frank about that. But Amazon now has a tremendous amount of data that they acquired through nefarious purposes. And what do you all think about Amazon since they never came up and they are on the cusp of becoming a huge participant in, in advertising? I'll let people do the data thing, but I, I, I believe the statistic is 43% of shopping online starts with a look on Amazon. I mean, that they're just, overtaking it in terms of uh, where pe people's first choice in terms of looking for um, that kind of information. What I, what I also know, which might be of interest to people in this room, is, is Google has already gotten into higher ed and is pursuing higher ed in a very big way. Amazon is on their way. They don't, we don't know exactly what Amazon is going to be doing, but Amazon is going to be entering into higher ed, and that's something that, that people should be looking at big time. And, and I will say that Amazon has gotten into video in a big way, and it's a very important part of their initiative. Uh, in addition to creating really quality original shows, they offer these niche SVOD services, which are like mini Netflix services. They have hundreds of them. We actually have four on the, three on the platform, something called Shudder, something called Sundance Now, and a service called Acorn that's focused on British dramas. But these are niche uh, SPOT services that appeal to a, a very uh, discreet portion of their customer base. And I believe anybody who takes advantage of their videos, they're, they're much higher buyers of just uh, products generally on the Amazon platform. So video is a very important initiative for them as part of their larger business. Yeah, if there was somebody, yeah, okay. Uh, Nelson, Nigel, Kidmoto, uh, mobile app connecting passengers seeking car seats to drivers that provide and install car seats. <laughs> so one of the tactics that we use is uh, social proof, reputation marketing. So we take about 10, 12 second testimonials from moms about our product and we just throw it, out, throw it out online and it just comes back to us. So it's like 12 second short videos. 
and it's worked. It's, it's, and it's working, so we just keep doing that. And what do you think? If it works. If it works, it's fine. Right. If it works, keep on doing it. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, I think the question, you know, again, with digital, digital is here to stay, and obviously all these techniques are going to be a part of all of our lives. Um, the reality is that uh, it's got to work. And there has been, in the last year or two, somewhat of a reconsideration among some major marketers about digital. I mean, notably, Procter & Gamble and Unilever are two huge companies, enormous advertisers, who have sort of said to the digital guys, not so fast. We're not so sure that this stuff is working. And you know, honestly, we're going to begin to kind of move some of that money back into the current medium. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, again, I think some of this is just you know, four or five years ago, if you were a marketing uh, you know, VP at a uh, client, you know, at, at a company, and you were not heavily invested in digital, you were going to lose your job because you were seen to be kind of a Luddite. Now I think there's a feeling that some stuff works great on digital, some stuff doesn't, but at the same time, there's something about that 30 second spot to sell certain kinds of product under certain kinds of circumstances that is still very, very effective. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, part, okay. because part of what they, because part of what they're realizing is that it's the digital companies that are devising the metrics to measure the success of digital advertising. Right? It's the digital companies that are coming up with those metrics. And then what, what part, the, part of the reason why Procter & Gamble made that statement was when they found out that what was it, 40, 50 percent of impressions were algorithms, were, were fake, they were bots clicking on ads. So all of a sudden, all of these metrics, they're not real. And then they realize, well, wait a minute, what about all that stuff that digital doesn't measure about a real advertising campaign? What about all those, what we used to call them intangibles? You know, what, what, what does Plop Plop Fizz Fizz do to us <laughs> over the long term in terms of our relationship to Alka-Seltzer? It does something that, that, that perfectly positioned, customized, you know, animated banner ad bot, you know, relationship maybe doesn't really do for more than 10 seconds. Yeah, uh, anywhere? Here. Go ahead. Oh, yes, hello. hello. How's everybody doing? Good, Good. Good. how are you? Great. <laughs> Good, I have a two-fold question. My first question is, due to the uprising in all the technological advances over the years, how do you see the newspaper readers, do you think the newspaper readers now are going up or do you think it's going down? I mean those readers who take a newspaper, especially the Sunday newspapers, sit in their easy chair and flip through all the different sections and what have you. Do you think that's going up and, and like to get the ink on their fingers? And do you think that that readership is going up or do you think it's going down because of the technological advances? And number two, the number two question is, what happened to all the Western shows that used to be on TV, especially in the 50s and 60s? Are they coming back? Thank you. We'll talk to Bob. He'll have yeah. a quick run on for you. I think we still do the Rifleman on Sunday mornings. <laughs> Well, Jeff uh, Daniels did one that was well received. What was that, Jeff Daniels? Uh, yeah. yeah. Mini series. Yeah. It's a hard genre to, to yeah. keep doing. <laughs> Look, as far as the uh, newspaper, I can be very quick on that. Yeah. Again, I told you I have often been up for millennials. So my oldest daughter is 32. She has never really, I don't remember her touching newsprint. She reads the Times every day, but she reads it online. The New York Times is all of a sudden making money on their digital platform. So what seems to be happening is. For many, many people, the, the digital world is replacing the physical newspaper, uh, but it isn't, um, you know, it isn't replacing it uh, entirely. The real issue, and it goes to what that gentleman over there said, is does this stuff work? I mean, is it as good to, to be exposed to an ad when you're reading the Times on your laptop or your tablet as it is when, you, as you said, in your easy chair flipping through and seeing an ad? And I think that's one of the things that marketers struggle with because at the end of the day, they don't really care how you get the ad. What they care about is did they sell more cans of Coca-Cola this week than last week? And if they didn't, somebody's got a problem. So that's sort of what it is. Yeah, and, I just wanted to get yeah, I wanted and, to get and, and you know, the ads on, on the New York Times on the phone, half the, time, half the clicks on those are by mistake because they'll take up so much of the screen yeah, that yeah. you can't scroll past and you end up yeah. clicking on it by accident. But also, think about the difference between reading news that's been customized for you on your device versus reading the New York Times on page. 
the, the article, if you don't like war articles, you don't read about war articles, you just always flip past them. Eventually, you're going to stop seeing them on your customized, beautiful version of the news. If you're looking at the newspaper, even if you're not going to read that war story, at least you know it's there. You know, where and the experience of the paper, again, is, is a window on the world as opposed to a window on you, you know? Uh, we've been, I, I'm told we have time for one more question, so, okay, there we go. This could be a panel all to itself, but uh, two years from this week, we have a thing called a uh, presidential election. What's going to be the um, uh, impact of uh, digital advertising on this? Because every four years, something new happens. Last time it was Facebook, time before, and it just changes the whole way it's done. Depends on who's elected, I guess, is my answer. Well, you know, there's two parts of this, and again, it goes to, to the genera generational aspect of this. If you're talking about older people, they're going to primarily see the ads on television. And um, for those of us who have worked in television, we all know television broadcasters love that time of year because they make a whole lot of money because there's just a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of advertising that happens at, because of elections. Mm -hmm. um, and so those ads are going to continue to exist. Um, in terms of, of the online content, you know, I don't have a whole lot of faith in Mark Zuckerberg. I promise to get everybody out of here, uh, and so I'm told oh, that we've got to stop. Oh, so here's the, 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 can, we, can we get the, the oh, sure. lady Let's in the back because she's had her hand quickly. up the whole time? Talk <laughs> quickly. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me without the uh, microphone? Yeah. Uh, okay. I have a... Uh, I came... Uh, I run a non-profit agency hoping that I can get some information how advertisement can help can help small non-profit agency because in New York State it's over a million uh, non-profit. Mm. So that's number one and I'm cancer survivor. Mm. I'd like to find out um, since you, uh, one of uh, people from the panel was talking about that they focusing on the young generation with the advertisement. My agency dealing with the disabled children and uh, my concern, my biggest concern, uh, is anybody checking how much that product uh, leads to the leukemia, mm -hmm. uh, cancer, and other uh, children's ca cancer. I really have big concern because uh, children uh, are suffering from the cancer, and uh, I like to find out if anyone checking what kind of product they selling. Uh, uh, advertising and uh, uh, because the kids see very colorful advertisement and uh, forcing parents to buy uh, this product and they don't know uh, that this product leads to the cancer. Mm -hmm. That's my question. <coughs> and That's a pretty big I'm, question. Uh, yeah. we don't, is there anybody, I, mean, I, I almost think that we need to talk about that sort of offline because it really isn't, I think, the confidence of this group. So we'll, we'll get you afterwards and we'll obviously be happy to have a conversation, but I did promise to get everybody out. I just want to finish up with one fast thing. We've talked about disruption. We've talked about how technology changes things. I just wanted to give you one example of the way in which uh, technologies change. Just take a look at this. Well, I don't know. That's, 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 <laughs> nothing like technology. <laughs> that was a 30-second advertisement that went directly to your neocortex. Act it out for us, Alan. <laughs> well, we'll do it. We'll do it. It's, it's, it's bad. Thank you.
Oh my god. <laughs> So that was about 20 years ago. Uh, you know, you saw the prize, by the way. Radio Shark isn't around, so that's how fast things happen. But if anybody has to make a call, you can borrow my phone. <laughs> so thank you all for that. Um, I wish to thank Alan and all of our panelists this morning. Another round of applause. A very stimulative and um, informative discussion, so thank you very much. And I do remember to get smartphones. Um, again, I just want to thank everyone for coming. I just have a couple of announcements. The first is on Monday and Tuesday next week, we have a two-day conference on understanding diverse and inclusive communities. It's going to take place here in the student ballroom from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And if you want more information, just see anyone at the tables outside. Uh, again, I just want to say anyone interested in becoming a sponsor or a friend of the forum, you can see any one of us at the end of the forum. We're happy to bring these informative QC business forums to both the college and our local communities. Our next forum will be March 15, 2019, when we will host another panel presentation entitled Business Communications, Technology, and the Law. Uh, we do have uh, some Queens College programs that will be seen on Spectrum and they are homeless in New York City, and the business forum breakfast that we did uh, before, small business is big business. I hope you enjoyed the forum, and before we leave, I just want to give our panelists a parting gift. Thank you.